Let's begin. So remember, 20 seconds to answer. 20 seconds to answer. Bismillah, starting with the first question. <clears throat> Salah in congregation is how many more times virtuous <coughs> than a salah performed individually? Father should know the answer to this. How many more times? Correct answer is 27. And there's some narrations that mention 25. All right, but 27 is the, the, the more common one. <coughs> 27 times more reward to pray in jama'ah than to pray by yourself. All right, next question. This person will be made to wear a brittle of fire on the day of judgment. The punishment for this person. All right, everybody make sure you answer within 20 seconds. The one who conceals knowledge, all right, conceals knowledge. The one who conceals knowledge, this is the punishment. <clears throat> all right, next question. Honoring, venerating, and revering the Prophet some is a higher degree than loving him. True or false? All right, so this is true. So we mentioned that uh, loving is one thing, but not all love involves veneration or revering or honoring. All right, so this is true. This is true because we mentioned the example of the father and the child, right? The father loves the child, but he doesn't venerate the child or revere the child, right? Because the father is a higher level than the child. So this is even higher than degree than love. Okay, next question. <clears throat> the Prophet says, none of you believes until I'm dear to him then, blank, blank, blank. Until I am dear to him then, min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'i. His father, his child, and all of mankind. None of you believes until uh, I am dear to him, then his father, his child, and all of mankind. Uh, I think a lot of people got that one wrong, looks like. Min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'i. That's the hadith. Why the Prophet chose those? Allahu alam, but this is the hadith. His father, his child, and his, all of mankind. All right, next question. <clears throat> Which two acts of worship are often paired together in the Quran? Salah and zakat. Wa qim al salah wa atu zakat. Right? Several times in the Quran it comes. Wa qim al salah wa atu zakat. Establish salah and pay the zakat. <clears throat> okay, next question. Envy with the meaning of wishing for a blessing to be taken away from someone is allowed in two situations. True or false? False, all right? The hadith mentions la hasada illa fitnatayn. There's no envy except for two, but we said that envy here is not in the real meaning, right? Because Allah would never, or the Prophet would never allow somebody to have true envy, 
So the envy that was in the hadith was meaning of you, you wish that you have that what that person has without wishing for it to be taken away from them. All right, so that's false. No, envy is never allowed in that meaning. It's never allowed in that meaning. Quick, yeah, trick question. Because the hadith mentions there is no envy except in two cases, but we said that that envy is not in its literal meaning. All right, next question. <clears throat> What is the meaning of the word iman in the verse? And never would Allah have called you to lose your iman. So this verse was revealed about uh, <clears throat> the, the Sahaba who died before the Qibla was changed. So. Uh, other Sahaba concerns about those who died before the Qibla was changed is their Salah still valid or accepted or not and Allah clarifies that all the Salahs that they pray towards Jerusalem those are still valid Salah Allah will never allow you or cause you to lose your Salah all the Salahs they pray towards Baitul Maqdis are all still valid all right, and we also mentioned that this word Iman it sometimes calls, it comes in the meaning of Salah in this verse and also in the Hadith Al-Tuhuru Shatrul Iman. Purification is half of Iman. Iman in that hadith also means Salah. Next question. The Prophet said, Every good action made by man shall be multiplied by blank up to blank. All right, from, so each action a person does is multiplied by at least 10, all the way up until 700. From 10 to 700. This is the normal scale of rewards, and we mentioned that this does not apply for which action? Fasting. This does not apply for fasting. Every other action, but fasting. Allah says that fasting is for me, and I will reward however I wish. All right, next question. Allah says in the Quran, proclaim to the people the Hajj. They will come to you on foot and every lean camel. They will come from every distant, deep ravine. Who was this addressed to? Who was this addressed to? This was addressed to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Al-Nasi bin Hajji. Addressed to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. All right, good. Yeah, almost pretty much everyone got that one, right? All right, uh, last question. Last question before we start today's session. Which of the following does not, not occur when a group of people gather in the house, one of the houses of Allah, to recite his book and study it amongst themselves? Surround. All, all of them, right? All four. All four. All four of these things happen when uh, believers gather together in a house from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they study the Quran. All four of these happen. All right, that was the last question. Who came out on top today? All right, third, AR, whoever that is. Number second, Imtiaz Zaman and Brother Roshan. Brother Roshan came in first, mashallah. Who's AR? Huh? Downstairs? Okay. Mashallah. Congratulations to everyone. All right. We'll begin, inshallah, today's session. We left off at the. Uh,
26. wal ashroon min shu'ab al-iman. The 26th branch of iman, al-jihad. Al-jihad. And of course, jihad, <coughs> it, uh, it has different meanings, but the primary meaning, the primary meaning, when it comes in the text of the Quran and Sunnah, is referring to warfare. Right? This is the primary meaning. Although it can mean, you know, jihad and nafs struggle against oneself, but the primary meaning of jihad is warfare. And this is what's meant in all the verses here. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمِ تَلَائِمِ And all the other verses uh, that are mentioned here. Allah says, make jihad in Allah's cause as is His right. They strive in the cause of Allah and do not fear the blame of the critic. Fight those adjacent to you of the disbelievers and let them find in you harshness. Why should we have harshness in, in this particular situation? When in, in warfare, anyone, anyone knows? Why, why should we have? What is the benefit of harshness? Okay, what does harshness do to the enemy? Scare them off, right? So when they see harshness, all right, just like you know when you're um, when dogs come together, right? There are two dogs that they're about to fight each other. What do they start to do? They start to who, who can bark the loudest? And the one that barks the loudest, then the other one is going to run away. All right. So this harshness is to fend off the enemy, so that you don't have to fight them. You know, if you can. The, if you can defeat them with words or uh, with, before having to fight it with, uh, with swords or any other uh, weaponry, then that what should happen. So this harshness is to prevent them from you know, having uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the motivation to continue fighting, right? to continue fighting. And we have the verse, O Prophet urged the believers to battle. And in the uh, hadith, what is the finest of all actions? Iman in Allah and His Messenger. And then what? Jihad in the path of Allah, and then what? An accepted hajj. We notice here that this question came before, and, and we saw this question before, and different answers were given, right? And we mentioned this before, that this question was asked to the Prophet ﷺ several times. What is the best action? And each narration, different things are mentioned. Different things are mentioned. So we had said that sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would answer according to the questioner. So the one is questioning, he sees that that questioner has a deficiency in this particular action. So he would give him answer for that person. So perhaps if like an old person comes and asks what is the best action, he would not have said jihad in the path of Allah. He might have given him something else. Uh, another person had come uh, to the Prophet he wanted permission to go out and fight. And Rasulullah noticed that this person had parents that needed to be taken care of. So he asked them, uh, are your parents alive? And he said yes. And then he said, for, so go and take care of them. And that will be your jihad. Uh, then it's narrated in Sahih Bukhari by Ibn Abi Awfa that the Prophet said, Do not look forward to encountering the enemy. Rather, I ask Allah for well being. Do not look forward to encountering the enemy. Rather, ask for well being. However, if you face them, then be steadfast and know that Jannah is under the shade of the swords. Why should you not look forward to encountering the enemy? Why not? Why should we not look forward to encountering the enemy? Anyone? Uh, is the uh, sisters, the number still there? Okay. Okay, you might be killed. Okay, but that's, I mean, if you get killed, you're in paradise. Huh? Okay, and anything else? Right. Because you can run away. Right? And this is running away is a major sin. All right, so you, you should never put yourself your iman at risk because you, you might hope to meet the enemy and then when the enemy comes you flee and this, you end up uh, causing yourself to fall into a major sin as we will see later on this is a, uh, this is a major sin Rasulullah was asked or he said in the hadith that they are uh, uh, be careful avoid the seven major sins and amongst them he mentioned and fleeing the battlefield uh, on the day of the, on the battle fleeing the battlefield so this is one of the major major sins so you should never look forward to things that are going to um, put your you know, iman to test. That's why you should never ask for trials. You shouldn't ask Allah for trials. Oh Allah, grant me a trial, tribulation, so I can pass it. Right? You don't ask for trials. You don't ask for tribulations. You don't ask to encounter the, the enemy. You don't try to uh, put your iman uh, to the test. Right? This is why the Prophet says that when the Dajjal comes out, what should you do? He said, when you, hear, when, the, when you hear about the Dajjal, what should you do? 
Go ahead, get away. Go far away. Don't try, to, don't try to face the Dajjal. Because people will go to try to face him. They think they have Iman and then they'll end up believing in him after. So you don't ever try to put your Iman to the test. All right? You don't put your Iman to the test. Don't look forward to the enemy. But if the enemy comes, then be firm. إِذَا لَقِيتُمْ فِئَةً فَثْبُتُوا When you face an enemy, then you have to be firm. Because then fleeing, when the battle starts, this is a major sin. Major sin. This is one of the seven destructive sins. You had a question? Yeah. Okay, okay. After? No, you want to ask it after? Or you ask it now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that statement it's, it's said to be a hadith, right? But so the question is, uh, it, there's a statement, that, a popular statement about uh, jihad of the nafs, right? Being the thing you should focus on the most. The greatest form of jihad. That, that's supposed to be, or claimed to be hadith, but I, I don't believe that's an actual hadith, uh, authentic hadith, back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright, so that's number one, right? That it's not uh, authentic hadith. And the answer to this is, we look at all the hadith we have, all the Quranic verses, talking about uh, the, the actual jihad of the warfare, of course, in its proper place. All right, that's the main thing. It has to be in its proper place. Obviously, we are living in America. We don't, you know, we, we're not able to discuss or you know, talk about practical jihad because it's not, it's not applying to us right now. All right? But if you look at all the verses and all the, the hadith, then it's clear that this is something virtuous. And we see that the Sahaba and Rasulullah himself engage in it. So this is obviously something that has uh, virtue. Wallahu alam. Oh, and know that Jannah is under the shade of the sword. This is a uh, glad tidings for people who are killed in battle. So people who are killed in battle, you have swords all over your head constantly. So know that if you're killed, if, you're, if the one of these swords kills you, then you're promised paradise. As we know, that the, the shaheed is promised paradise. Right? So this is a glad tidings for paradise if you're killed as a martyr. Allah uh, Moving on. Now, uh, all the, uh, we mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of this book that uh, these, are, uh, these branches of Iman make up the complete believer, right? They make up the complete believer. And ideally, you, want, you would want to have uh, all of these things checked off, all the 77 branches that we have checked off. But then we also mentioned that some of these are situational, meaning that you might not be able to attain this specific branch of Iman because its application is not there. And this is one of these, right? You had, and then this one here as well, al murabata which is guarding the frontiers, guarding the borderlands. So this is, uh, some of the scholars include this in, uh, as part of jihad, and others, they separate it because uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran have singled it out specifically. So this is protecting the, border, the borders, right? This is what you call today what we call that today in modern uh, border patrol or something else? Homeland security or defense forces, right? Defense, defense forces. So these are people, they're not actually fighting, but they are prepared to fight. All right, they're prepared to fight. And this is uh, mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran. Ya ayu al amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. All right, uh, all you who believe, persevere and endure and remain stationed. Right, remain stationed, ready for battle. And fear Allah that you may be successful. And in the hadith, to spend one day in the path of Allah is better than the world and all it contains. The space of a man's whip in Jannah is better than the world and all that it contains. The space, imagine that, right? The space of a person's whip, which is meant to be something very small, very small, um, sm very small thing, uh, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, the length or the width of a person's whip. That is better than all that is in this world and all that it contains. And uh, to have a better idea of what this is, it's called murabata, it's also called ribat. Right? Both of these are terms used. Ribat is to jihad, what i'tikaf is to, uh, in the measure is to salah. Meaning, uh, when you are in i'tikaf, you're not actually doing anything, right? You're waiting. You're in the measure waiting for the salah to commence. 
but you're not you know, necessarily engaged in anything. So this is what ribat is, which is you're not fighting, but you're preparing and you're waiting and you are ready if anything happens to, uh, to fight if, if needed. So this is the connection right, between ribat and i'tikaf. They're very similar. The person who is mu'takif, they are waiting for the salah to commence and the person who is in uh, murabata, they are waiting for the battle to commence, but they're not actually fighting. But nonetheless, this is something very virtuous to, to remain in the, uh, the borders guarding. This is what we mentioned as well before earlier, uh, which is determination in the face of an enemy and not fleeing. Not fleeing. This is one of the major sins that once the battle commences, that you are not allowed to flee. And this is a major, major sin from the seven destructive sins. All right? So this is why Rasulullah Sallam says, don't wish to meet the enemy. Because if you meet the enemy and then you flee, now you have incurred upon yourself a major sin. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you, when you encounter a, a, a company or a force, فَثْبُتُوا إِذَا لَقِيتُمْ فِئَةً فَثْبُتُوا And in the verse, now there's two exceptions as mentioned in the next verse. إِذَا لَقِيتُمُ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا زَحْفًا فَلَا تُوَلُّهُمَ الْأَدْبَارُ right? Do not show them your back. Two exceptions are mentioned here. The exception is, uh, and whoever turns his back to them on such a day, unless swerving as a strategy, meaning a tactical retreat. So in a battlefield, sometimes you might need to retreat as a tactical maneuver. Right? You retreat back so that you can make a counteroffensive. Right? This is allowed, and this is not considered fleeing. So unless this is a swerving as a strategy of war or joining another company. So you're retreating or you're going back not to leave the battlefield but to join another battalion. So that you join up another battalion and then you'll come together and then launch a counteroffensive. Right? So in these two particular scenarios you can leave the battlefield. But that's not considered fleeing. That's not considered fleeing. Uh, but this is allowed to leave the battlefield for these two reasons and these two reasons only. But leaving as in fleeing out of fear, this is not allowed and this is a major sin. Uh, and then the verse continues. Uh, so, except in these situations, if you have fleed the battlefield, then this person has certainly returned with anger from Allah and his refuge is hell. And wretched is the destination. And uh, we have the verse, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu harridil mu'minina al qital. If there are amongst you 20 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. What is the ratio of this? 20 to 200. What is the ratio? All right, one to 10. This verse was abrogated. So this, is, this was at the beginning. At the beginning, it was mandatory that if you face an enemy 10 times your size, all right, you have to stay firm. So if there's one believer and there was 10 disbelievers in front of him, he's not allowed to leave. He has to stay and fight. This was the command. And then this was then abrogated. And then this was reduced to a ratio of one to two. If there are 100 steadfast warriors, then they will be able to face 200. So this was uh, abrogated, this verse was abrogated, and uh, the, uh, the ruling then became, if there is one believer, then he has to take on at least two. He has to take on at least two. And if it's more than that, then it is allowed to not uh, take part in the fight, but this is the, the minimum. And it's narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, do not look forward to encounter an enemy, and we mentioned this hadith already, uh, rather ask for Allah for well-being, and if you face them, then be steadfast. And know that the Jannah is under the shade of the swords. Attasa wal ashroon min shu'ab al-Iman الخمس من المغنم إلى الإمام وعماله على الغانمين لقوله تعالى وعملوا أنما وعلم وأنما غنمتم من شيء فإن لله خمسه وللرسول وليد القربى واليتامى والمساكين وبن السبيل إن كنتم آمنتم بالله وما أنزلنا وقول تعالى وما كان للنبي أن يغل وما يغل يأتي بما غل يوم القيامة and other hadith we mentioned here uh, so this is what we call غنيمة which is the spoils of war the spoils of war so when, when there's a battle, when there's a battle, and the enemy leaves, they leave behind weapons, they leave behind uh, war, uh, back in those days it used to be horses or camels, now it might be tanks, it might be um, you know, planes or whatever. Whatever they leave behind, the Muslims take that, that is called ghanima. Right? That is called ghanima, spoils of war. 
any money, wealth, clothing, anything that they leave behind, this is for the Muslims to take, and this is called ghanima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this something else in the Quran. Anybody know what that's called? What does Allah call in the Quran? Ghanima. Give you a hint. This is a chapter in the Quran named after this. Chapter in the Quran. Anfal. Yasalunaka ali al anfal, kulil anfalu lillahi wa rasul. They ask you about the anfal, the spoils of war. Allah calls ghanima the spoils of war. He calls it anfal in the Quran. Uh, same thing, right? The same thing. The anfal and the ghanima, same thing. These are what the, uh, what the Muslims take from the enemy after they had defeated them in battle. Now, uh, this ghanima that they take, it has to be divided up in a specific way, which is that a fifth of it has to go to what's mentioned here in the verse. Uh, I know that anything you obtain of war booty, then indeed for Allah is one fifth of it, and for the messenger and his relatives and the orphans and the needy and the stranded traveler. So one fifth of the spoils of war has to go to this, these categories of people. And then the rest, the rest of the, the ghanima, the, four, the rest of the four fifths is then divided amongst the, the warriors, divided amongst the, uh, those who took part in the battle. Uh, so this is called uh, the ghanima, and one fifth of it has to go to these people mentioned here in the verse. And it is a sin, it's a major sin to take from this ghanima before it is distributed. Right, so this uh, this ghanima has to be collected by the imam, and it has to be distributed. And if anybody goes and takes this ghanima before it's distributed, then this is called ghulul. Right, and this is a major sin, which is taking from the spoils of war before it has been uh, has been distributed. And this is what's mentioned in the next verse: It is not uh, attributable attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully, meaning he would uh, take from the uh, the ghanima without distributing it fairly. And whoever betrays by taking this ghanima unf- unlawfully will come what, we ha- what he took on the day of resurrection. And then the hadith, I enjoy you to do, uh, enjoin you to do four things and to renounce four others. I enjoin you to believe in, uh, in the one Allah. Do you know what is to believe in the one Allah? And then he said, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, it is to testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad وسلم, is Rasulullah to establish the salah, to give the zakah, to fast Ramadan, and then he mentions to give one fifth of any spoils of war. Look at this hadith carefully. What do we see that's missing? Hajj. Why is Hajj missing? Good. All right. It had not been obligated. It hasn't been prescribed yet. So all these other have been mentioned. Hajj was not yet uh, mandated. So in place of Hajj, it's mentioned here to give one fifth of any spoils of war. This is Rasulullah uh, mentions this as. Uh, belief in Allah and uh, in the Messenger to to give the zakah and fast Ramadan and to give one fifth of any spoils of war. And I enjoin you to renounce for other things. And he mentions things have uh, utensils of alcohol that he used to uh, they used to drink in these utensils. Uh, and these uh, we know that uh, alcohol was prohibited in stages, and uh, these are things that they used to drink the alcohol in. Observe these orders and speak of them to the people you know. Yes. This hadith, I believe, um, I have to double check, but I believe it's abrogated. Uh, in fact, I'm fairly certain it was abrogated. That this was at the beginning, when they were newly getting used to um, leaving off alcohol, and they still had you know, a, a huge attachment to alcohol. So these things were prohibited for that reason, because they were reminded them of the alcohol. But later on, this was abrogated. And they were allowed to use these utensils afterwards, as long as, of course, it's not filled with alcohol. So, uh, as long as you're not drinking alcohol, then permissible. Hmm? Hmm? Right, yes, yes. Right, yeah, yeah, so that confirms it. That the hadith was abrogated, right? That hadith was abrogated. Uh, the question was about um, these, uh, these, well, repeat the question again. Yeah. Right, non alcoholic drinks. So, we have non alcoholic drinks, they look just like alcohol. What is the ruling of them? Uh, based on, in light of this hadith, and we said that this hadith is abrogated to begin with, so you can drink in these vessels, 
as long as you're not drinking alcohol. And so the same thing would apply to anything else that, you know, might, now you can say it might be best to avoid these things because then they might lead to somebody actually, you know, eventually really drinking alcohol. But uh, to say that it's haram, you know, as long as it's not drinking actual alcohol. Wallahu uh, a'lam. Thalathun min shu'ab al-iman al-itku biwajhi taqarbu ila Allahi azza wa jal li qawli ta'ala falaqtaham al-aqaba wa ma adraakum al-aqaba. And the hadith, man a'taqa raqba, a'taqa Allahu bi kulli udwin minha, udwan min a'da'ihi min al-nari hatta farjuhu bi farjihi. So once it's abrogated, so the question is, can we use this as proof, even though it's been abrogated? Once it's been, the ruling has been abrogated, then it cannot be used as proof anymore. But the hadith is, the part of the hadith, not the whole hadith has been abrogated, right? Just that last part. So the rest of the hadith still stands, all right? So it's a long hadith, and the point of this hadith was the, that part about one-fifth of the, the spoils. So that was the part that was, we're using as proof. So that's still valid. But the last part of the hadith is abrogated. And so that last part is no longer we, we can't use that as proof anymore. All right, the thirtieth uh, branch of iman, freeing slaves as an act of worship, and we know that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made a number of uh, different ways to free the slave. All right, uh, as punishment for certain for certain sins. All right, so you know, a person this, uh, there's something called liha, where a person does a type of divorce. All right, where they say that they say to their wife that you are like my mother. All right, uh, and then there's a punishment for that. One of those, one of the punishments is freeing a slave. All right, that's not what's meant here. All right, so there are certain ways in which Allah has uh, made punishments. You you do certain a certain crime, and you have to atone for that crime by freeing a slave. All right, that's different than freeing a slave as an act of worship. Right, as an act of worship, uh, which is that you're doing it not because this is, you you committed some kind of uh, crime and then you have to pay for that or expate for that but you do it solely for the sake of Allah this is what is a branch of Iman and the verse but he, ha, uh, but he has not broken through the difficult past and what can, you mean, what can make you know what is breaking through the difficult past it is the freeing of a slave this verse in Surah Al-Balad and in the hadith whoever frees the limbs of a slave Allah will free the same limbs for him from the fire even if his private parts in praise, place of the slave's private parts uh, of course we know that slavery is uh, non-existent today, so none of these hadiths really or verses really apply to us. But so we look for other ways to uh, fulfill virtuous deeds, but these are no longer uh, applicable to us. Al-Hadi wal thalatun min shu'ab al-Iman al-Kafarat al-Wajibat bil Jinayat. This is what we just mentioned, that there's certain expiation. You commit a certain sin and you have to expiate with that sin uh, by doing such and such and such. All right, uh, and what's mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah are four expiations: kafaratul qatl, wa kafaratul dhihar, wa kafaratul yamin, wa kafaratul masis fi sawmi Ramadan. Four things. All right, four things. If you do them, then you have to expiate for them. You have to expiate for them. The first is the atonement for murder. The person murders somebody, and this is whether you murder intentionally or unintentionally. All right, intentionally or unintentionally, there is a expiation. All right, there's an expiation where a person has to. Uh, either free a slave or they have to uh, fast two consecutive months. All right, so there is an expiation for murder. There's an expiation for what we just mentioned, the bihar. All right, this is where a person uh, says that to their wife, you are like my mother or you are like the back of my mother. And this is a type of divorce. So if they don't follow it up by a real divorce right afterwards, then they have to do an expiation. Right? They have to pay an expiation. And this is mentioned in uh, Surah Talaq. And there is atonement for a uh, broken oath. You make an oath, and then you break that oath, then you have to expiate for that. And there's an atonement for 
a person having intercourse or marital relations in Ramadan intentionally, intentionally having intercourse in Ramadan while fasting, then there's a, there's a uh, expiation for that. All right, so these, these are all part of uh, branches, a branch of Iman, which is that if you do any of these things, as we said, right? Not all the branches apply, they're situational. If you do any of these things, then you must expiate for them, uh, which, which, which whatever what Allah has prescribed the expiation to be. And there are also similar obligatory penalties known as fidya, which are for a previous sin or which may be done to bring one closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after something which has happened, whether or not it was of a sinful nature. So there's something called uh, kafarat, which is atonement for certain sins, and there's something also called fidya, which is may, it might not be a sin or maybe a sin, uh, but this is something is similar. That you have to uh, do something in, uh, to expiate or to uh, make up for what you have missed. So all these are part of Iman, but as we said, they are situational. If you do these things, then these things apply, and it becomes part of Iman for you to uh, observe the rulings of these uh, things. Yeah. Yes. You have to atone for it. Yeah, you have to atone for it. If you, yeah, you have to atone for it. All right, moving on. Thani wa thalathun min shu'ab al-iman al-ifab al-uqud to fulfill covenants, fulfill one's undertakings, or fulfill your covenants. Ya yu aladina amnu awfu bil-uqud undertakings or covenants or contracts. All these are meanings of of this word. Aqt or uqud, the plural which is your covenants, your undertakings, your contracts. Uh, Ibn Abbas says this refers to one's promise to observe Allah's permissions, prohibitions, commands, and limits as set out in the Quran. So there's a general meaning of uqud. Uh, uqud can mean, as Ibn Abbas says, fulfilling Allah's commands, staying away from his prohibitions. It's a general meaning. And then there's the specific meaning of specific contract, like a marriage contract, right? like a business contract. Right? This is a spe specific meaning of uqud. And there's a general meaning, and then there's this specific meaning. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, those who fulfill the, their vows, الَّذِينَ يُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ Right, those who fulfill their vows, uh, and among them are such as, uh, as vow unto Allah, be true to your bond with Allah. All right, all these verses are emphasizing the need to fulfill any, any vows you make, or any contracts that you get into, any uh, agreements that you make, you need to go through it and carry through with it. And the opposite of this is treachery, right? Treachery. It comes in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari that on the day of resur resurrection, every treacherous man will bear a banner. So if you commit treachery, khiyana, then you'll have to wear a banner on the day of judgment, all right? So everyone will see you, that you're a treacherous person. You have to wear this banner and it will be said, behold, the treachery of so-and-so, right? So you have to wear this banner and everybody's going to see what you did, right? And the, 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 the default when it comes to sins is that Allah will hide your sins. Even on the Day of Judgment, Allah, Allah will hide your sins. But certain sins will be made apparent on the Day of Judgment. And this is one of them. If, you, if you're treacherous, uh, you go back on your agreement, then this person will be made to carry this banner and it will be said, Behold the treachery of so-and-so. This person is a treacherous person. And it is also narrated uh, in the Hadith, there are four things which make a man a pure hypocrite. So these are things that we obviously need to pay very careful attention to because nobody wants to be a pure hypocrite. And the hypocr hypocrite meaning in here is uh, nifaq amali. We have something called nifaq uh, i'tiqadi. And you have nifaq amali. So nifaq i'tiqadi is when a person, in their heart, they don't actually believe. They don't have iman in their heart. And they claim that they believe. And this is the type of nifaq which makes a person enter the worst depths of the fire. That the, the, the hypocrites, the true hypocrites, the hypocrites who actually do not believe in Allah and His Messenger, but claim that, then they will be in the lowest depths of the fire. And then you have something called nifaq amali, which is you are a hypocrite in action. So you might, in your heart, you actually believe, but your actions show otherwise. Right? This is called nifaq amali, right? Hypocrisy in action. And of course, this is also something to be avoided, but it's not to the level which makes a person disbeliever. But nonetheless, this is major sin. 
So there are four things which make a person a pure hypocrite, meaning a hypocrite in action, if they are all present within him. And a partial hypocrite if only one is present. Now, the first thing, if he lies, uh, he spe- when, when, uh, when he speaks, he lies. If he lies when he speaks, or he, the translation here is a bit messed up. He lies when he speaks. And he, uh, he cheats. When he commits to something, he cheats. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he argues, argues he devi- deviates from the truth. Right? These are four things that uh, if a person does them, then, and you have all four of these together in you, then you are a pure hypocrite in action. And if you have one of these, then you have a trait from the traits of the hypocrites. And in the hadith, the condition which one is most obli- obliged to fulfill is that which enters upon at the time of marriage. As we mentioned that this word, aqd or qud, uqud has uh, different meanings. And from amongst them is the actual, you know, contracts that we get into. Including in, in them is the marriage contract. So in this hadith, the Rasulullah I'm saying that the contract that you should take the most care to fulfill is this marriage contract, right? Because this is the contract where allows you a person to be intimate with, uh, with, with the woman and with that he has certain responsibilities and he has certain rights and the woman has certain responsibilities and she has certain rights. So this p- specific type of contract is the one that Rasulullah says you should, uh, has the most, uh, most obliged to fulfill. No, uh, mm. no, it, it, only, it only goes in effect if you swear by Allah or one of his attributes. But he swore by Allah, right? No, he, he was talking about swearing by Allah. But if you swear by, uh, by creation, then the, 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 the is, is, is invalid. It will be invalid. Hmm? No, but it's haram to swear by other than Allah. So... So you shouldn't be doing that to begin with. You shouldn't be taking a vow or swearing by any, anything other than Allah. All right. Um, but if a person does so, then it, it's not a void. It won't. It won't have any effect. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the middle. Right, so the question is uh, if a person says inshallah, is that considered to be uh, like a vow? Right. Right. Um, there are certain uh, statements that are what we call like uh, they are surih, they are clear. If you say them, then it automatically takes effect. All right, and then there are certain statements that it goes back to your intention. So this will one of will be one of those that goes back to your intention. So there are certain statements that if you make them, like uh, wallahi, all right, that cannot take any other meaning, right? So those it doesn't matter what your intention is. If you say that, then it goes into effect. But there are other statements that it can be one way or the other. So that go, those go back to your intention. They go back to your intention. Mm-hmm. Right, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, so your question was, was about vows or in general? Right, oh, okay, okay. I, yeah, I think, I think I misunderstood your question. I, th- I thought you were talking about like vows and uh, no. In general, right, um, does this fall under undertakings? Yes, yes, it would, of course, yeah. If you, make, if you have that intention, 
right? You say inshallah, and it's understood amongst you know amongst the, the, the other party that this is an agreement. Then you have to fulfill that agreement, right? Yeah, if you say with the intention, if if it's understood, right? Yeah. Right. Mm. Of course, yeah. Yeah, well then you're, you're going to fall under that other, uh, the treachery. <laughs> you're going to fall under that treacherous person uh, category. Yeah, but if, if, if there's an agreement, even if it's not clear, but it's you say inshallah meaning that we both understood that this is agreement that you're going to do this thing. And then you don't do it, then this would fall under not fulfilling your undertakings. Allah mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would fall under what we call lagul yameen, which is uh, a person says it but they don't intend it. La yu Allah says He will not take you into account for what a person says. Um, love was like you know they don't intend it really it just comes out of their mouth and this is this is, used to be common as well in the time of the Prophet they would make these oaths but they didn't really intend it so these these are called love al yameen which is uh, it, it, the person doesn't really intend it just saying it just coming out of their mouth we are out of anger then they didn't really intend it then these are not uh, these are not counted Allah will not call them to account mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to recall the verse. Dawood, if you can help me out here. The verse. لا يؤخذهم باللوي في إيمانك ولكن يؤخذهم بما عقدوا بالإيمان فكثرته إطعموا عشرة مساكين من أوسط ما تطعمون أو أهليكم. So you have to feed ten people, right? Um, أو كسوتهم, or you have to clothe ten people. And if uh, if a person not able to do it, فمن لم يجد فصيام ثلاثة أيام, right? If you're not able to do that, you have to fast three days. So that's the that's the atonement for uh, breaking your oath, breaking your oath. Allah. All right. Um, where are we? So if you have these four qualities, then you are a pure hypocrite, and and we mentioned about the marriage. Okay, moving on to الثالث الثلاثون من شعب الإيمان تعديد نعم نعم الله عز وجل to uh, count the favors of Allah subhanahu wa taala. To recount the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give the necessary thanks. Uh, as we know the verse, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُهَا Very well-known verse in the Qur'an. If you were to try to count the favors of Allah upon you, you would never be able to count it. Uh, and Allah says in the Surah Al-Duha, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ As for the favor of your Lord, then report it, then announce it. So if you have a favor upon you, then some, some people might, you know, have a very common misunderstanding that you should, any, any good thing, you should just keep it to yourself. But Allah says in the Quran, Something you have uh, that's good, a favor that Allah has given you, then you can, you can announce it and you can say it to the people, with a, of course, with pure intentions, as long as you have pure intentions. And in the verse, I remember me and I remember you. Give thanks to me and reject me not. And many other verses of this nature. Uh, and in the hadith, the Prophet would say, in your name, I, uh, when he would go to bed at night, in your name do I die and I am given life again. And when he would uh, wake up, he would say, praise be to Allah who gave me life after he gave, uh, caused me to die. And unto him shall be the resurrection. All this is basically giving thanks. Right? Giving thanks that every day you wake up, this is a blessing. Every day you wake up, this is a blessing. You don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow morning. So, Rasulullah when you say this before he goes to bed at night, because we don't know if we're going to wake up in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, once again, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allowed you to get up in the morning because that was not guaranteed. And the hadith, the affairs of a believer are astonishing and all are all good. That when good comes to him, he gives thanks. Well, when something bad comes to him, he is patient, which is also good for him. Uh, <clears throat> and then he brings a number of lines of poetry. We'll mention one which is, uh, which is uh, important, which is uh, the statement. Uh, Al-Junaid says, I once heard a Sali saying, because to give thanks for blessings is in itself a blessing, one can never cease to give thanks. 
So this is something very interesting that the fact that Allah has allowed you to give bless, to, to, to praise him and give uh, thanks for his blessings. This is another reason for you to give more thanks. So this cycle continues, right? The fact that Allah has given you the ability to give thanks is a reason for you to give even more thanks. And so this continues every time, right? Because every time you give thanks, this is another reason. You should thank Allah for giving you the ability to give thanks. And then thank Allah for giving you the ability to give thanks and so on like that. All right? And then something similar has also been mentioned uh, on, the, on the opposite side, which is when it comes to istighfar. When we, make istighfar, when we, seek, we seek Allah's forgiveness, when the scholars mention that our istighfar needs istighfar. That we are so uh, deficient in our istighfar that we need to make istighfar because we are deficient in our istighfar. So this is the opposite of that. So when you give thanks, this is the reason for you to thank Allah because He allowed you to give thanks. All right, moving on. We'll skip some of these uh, lines of poetry. Move on to Arabi wa Thalatun min Shu'ab al-Iman. Hifdul lisan amma la yahtaju ilayhi wa yadkhulu fihi al-kadim wal-ghiba wal-namima wal-fuhsh. Uh, protecting one's tongue from the sins of the tongue, which include lying, backbiting, slandering, carrying false tales, and uh, unnecessary speech. Holding one's tongue from unnecessary speech, which includes lying, slandering, backbiting, uh, and obscenity. We mentioned before, right, uh, that <clears throat> uh, the what is uh, I don't know. We didn't mention it before. What is the difference between Ghiba, uh, right, and and uh, namima, backbiting. What is what is backbiting? First of all, what is backbiting? Anyone know? So there's something called ghiba, which is backbiting, and there's also something called, after that called buhtan. Anybody know the difference between the two? So what is backbiting? What is backbiting? Okay. Right, so that's the key thing. When you, the, what, what we consider ghiba is to say something that is true about somebody. It's true. And this is what the, the justification many people give, right? When, you, when they're backbiting and you say, don't say that, you know, well, it's true, right? Well, this is the actual definition of ghiba, backbiting, that it is true, but they don't like for you, for you to say that. If it's false, then that's something else. It's called buhtan, which is now you're like, you're slandering that person, all right? So backbiting, is when you say something true about somebody and they don't like to hear it. So you can't use that justification when you're backbiting somebody. Well, it's true because this is the definition of backbiting. And we know the punishment of backbiting or the, what Allah compares it to, right, in the Quran, which is like uh, eating the dead flesh of your brother. Yes, yes. There are certain times when backbiting is permissible. Right. Warning um, and certain other situations. Hmm? It would fall under backbiting, but it would be fall under the permissible backbiting. Because backbiting is, as we said, saying something that they don't like to hear. So they wouldn't like to hear it, even if, it, you know, even if, it's, if it's true, they wouldn't like to hear it. Then this is, by the definition, backbiting. But it would be permissible in certain situations. All right, like a person is stealing and cheating in the community, then you need to let people know that this person is a, a fraud. Right? This person is a fraudster. We need to let people know. All right, or when it comes to marriage as well, a uh, person uh, is coming and they want to, you know, they're interested in marrying this certain person. Do you know anything about them? Then you can mention that this person, you know, they're a good person, but they have this quality. And you can mention that in in, in situation like that. So there are certain times when backbiting is allowed. But the general rule is that it is uh, something prohibited. Namima. Namima is uh, carrying tales. So you, you spread something and then, someone, and then it goes all around. This is, that's what Namima is, the spread around uh, false tales. It's like slandering, yeah. It's like slandering. I think you would consider slandering as well. All right, the Quran uh, mentioned the verse, truthful men and truthful women. Right, uh, oh you who believe fear Allah and be with those who are true, truthful. Do not concern yourself <clears throat> with that which you have no knowledge. Right, all these are hadiths about uh, and verses about uh, avoiding these things, avoiding lying, slandering, backbiting, and obscenity. 
And we have the, uh, the well-known hadith. <coughs> Truthfulness leads to goodness. Right? Truthfulness leads to goodness. As-sidqu yahdi ila al-birr. Wal-birr yahdi ila al-jannah. And goodness leads to jannah. And a man will tell the truth and he will continue to tell the truth until Allah records him as being a man of truthfulness. And lying leads to wickedness. And wickedness leads to the fire and a man will continue to lie until Allah records him as a liar. And we, we notice this, that uh, a person who gets into the, uh, starts to lie, they start to continue to lie until they become a habitual liar, until almost every word of their mouth is a lie. And then they make up one lie and then they have to cover up that one lie with another lie and then they're in a web of lies and you know they're just everything that comes out their mouth is a lie so this is some, what we're supposed to mention here a person continues to lie until they are written as a liar Yes, yes. So this is, that would be one of the situations where you can backbite. Yeah, the, the question is, can you uh, back somebody, somebody doing some haram, a teacher, right? Teachers committing some kind of haram behavior. So warn a person. Uh, depends though, it depends on what that person, if, if that teacher is doing something that is between them and Allah, then you don't have any right to backbite that person and, and spread that mistake. All right, but if they're doing something that is affecting others, then it becomes permissible to let people know. But if they're doing something that is between them and Allah, then the, 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 the best thing is to hide a person's sins and, and hide their faults. But if they're doing something that's gonna affect others, then you can uh, let people know about that. All right, we have the hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim. Whoever can promise me that, with, uh, that, will, that he will be virtuous, that which is between his jaws, meaning his tongue, and that which is between his thighs, meaning his privates, then uh, I will promise that person he will go to Jannah. I will promise that person to go to Jannah. <clears throat> and uh, the well-known hadith as well, anyone who believes in Allah and the last day should speak with goodness or be silent. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, say what is good or remain silent. One of the two, and there should not be any third option. الخامس والثلاثون من شعب الإيمان الأمانات وما يجب فيها من أدائها إلى أهلها الأمانات holding the things in trust for others so this also has a specific meaning and also has a general meaning so the general meaning is fulfilling any type of trust that you have between uh, for a person all right uh, and this can include many many things and then you have the specific meaning which is somebody gives you something right somebody gives you something and they tell you to guard this for me or hold this for me until I come back, then this is uh, what we call in uh, fiqh wadi'a. Wadi and this, there's a chapter in fiqh on this, the, uh, which is uh, the ruling regarding what we call wadi'a, which is somebody gives you something to hold. Uh, there, there's a chapter in fiqh on that. Can you travel with it? Uh, if they ask for it, do you have to give them back right away? And all these fiqh rulings are related to that. So there's a specific meaning, which is somebody gives you something to entrust, uh, and you know, where do you have to leave it? Can you store it somewhere, anywhere in the house? Can you, where do you have to store it? All this is a fiqh subject. And then you have the general meaning, which is trust, right? Just overall trust, uh, which is uh, more general in application. Allah says in the Quran, Allah commands you to deliver what you have been entrusted to. In Allah, uh, uh, what's the verse? Allah commands you to deliver the uh, trust. This verse was revealed to uh, the to the holder of the uh, about the holder of the keys of the Kaaba. Right. So the, uh, when Rasulullah conquered uh, Mecca, the the people who were had the keys of the Kaaba they were non-Muslims. They they still were on upon, upon disbelief, and the keys were taken away from them. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala ordered that the keys give, be given back to them that they are the rightful uh, owners of this or, or rightful uh, not, not owners of the keys but they're, they're the rightful uh, people to take on this responsibility and Allah ordered them to continue this responsibility and by the way this continues on uh, even to this day that same family uh, has the keys to the Kaaba even I don't know if they're still and has any real function but they still have the keys of the Kaaba that same family who had the keys all the way back in the time of the Prophet 
Uh, and the hadith give what you hold and trust back to the person who entrusted you to it and do not betray anyone even should he have betrayed you. And uh, once again, the hadith on the hypocrite, this time it mentions three qualities. The one we mentioned before had four, this one has three. There are three things which a present in a man show him to be a hypocrite. Even if he prays, fasts, or claims to be a Muslim. If he, when speaking, he lies. If when making a promise, he breaks his promise. And if when entrusted with anything, he betrays his trust. Three things, are, so three of the four are mentioned. And the fourth one is mentioned in the other hadith. What was the fourth one? Anybody remember? What was the fourth one? So three of them are mentioned here. The other hadith had mentioned four. What was that fourth quality of the hypocrite? Right. So when he argues, he gets uh, very abusive. Very abusive. So these are, those are the four qualities. You have them, then you are a pure hypocrite in action. السادس والثلاثون من شعب الإيمان تحريم قتل النفوس والجنايات عليها. The prohibition of murder. The prohibition of murder. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, whoever deliberately murders a believer shall be rewarded, meaning punished, with Jahannam, where he shall remain forever and Allah's wrath shall be upon him. Uh, this verse mentions that the one who intentionally kills a believer shall remain in the fire forever. Forever. Even though we know that a believer does not go into fire forever. So the scholars have interpreted this to mean that it's not meant to be taken literally, but it's meant to mean a very long time. When a believer kills another believer intentionally, they will be in the fire for a very long time. But the belief of Ahlul Sunnah in general is that anybody who has even the slightest bit of Iman is going to eventually enter paradise, even though they might have to go into the fire for some time. So this person who intentionally murders a believer, then they will be in the fire of Jahannam. Allah mentions forever, but not meant to be taken literally, but they will be in there for a very long time. And the hadith to murder a Muslim is kufr. And to insult him is wickedness. And the other hadith, the first injustices to be brought on the day of judgment will be those involving bloodshed. So people have many different disputes. All right, and the first dispute that will be settled on the day of judgment are those disputes involving bloodshed. Somebody killed somebody else, then those are the first things that will be taken care of on the day of judgment. And uh, the hadith of Ibn Umar, a Muslim remains firmly attached to his deen as long as he has not spilt forbidden blood. All right, a person will be, continue, لا يزال المسلم في فسحة من دينه ما لم يصب دما حراما. A person will continue to be upright in their religion as long as they do not spill forbidden blood. And this is why it's uh, so confusing or ironic that you find right, people who, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are killing and murdering without any, any care, right, with any care or concern. And they will do this to Muslims. Right? They will go and they will blow up a, a masjid in a Muslim country. And they will claim to do this for the sake of Allah, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will be outward looking very religious. But they are committing a sin that Rasulullah SAW says will be the first to be settled on the Day of Judgment. And he also says that a person will continue to be upright in the religion as long as they don't spill blood that's not permitted to be spilled. So this is the prohibition of murder. And of course this was the, uh, the very first uh, crime, right? The very first crime that was committed was murder. Or before that, envy and then murder. The two sons of Adam alayhi salam. They were, one of them got envy of the, envious of the other one, and then he killed him. And this was the very first murder that was committed on earth. Uh, this will be, inshallah, we'll take this one and maybe uh, one more after this and then end. Saving oneself from adultery by adopting chastity, Allah says, men who guard their private parts and women who guard their private parts. And those, will, uh, those who guard their private parts will have to uh, him. And the verse in the Quran, do not come near adultery, wala zina. Right? Do not come near adultery, for it is foulness and an evil way. And in the hadith, the adulterer, this, uh, this hadith is also uh, often misunderstood, this hadith. The adulterer is not a believer while he is committing adultery. And the drinker of wine is not a believer while he is drinking wine. And the thief is not a believer while he is stealing. The plunderer is not a believer while he is plundering, and the people are looking to him. So this hadith 
in its uh, apparent meaning would seem to indicate that anybody who's committing these sins is no longer a believer. Right? But the belief of Ahlul Sunnah is that major sins do not take you out of Islam. And this is something that uh, was claimed by a deviant group called the Khawarij. They were one of the very first deviant sects that came out in Islam. And their view was that if you commit a major sin, you have exited Islam completely. All right, so the belief of Ahl Sunnah is that even if you commit a major sin, you're still a believer. So this hadith is not to be taken literally. It essentially means a person is not a complete believer. So adulterer is not a believer, meaning he's not a complete believer. He has deficiency in his iman, but he's still a believer even if he commits major sins. And same thing for the, the one who drinks wine and the thief. الثامن والثلاثون من شعب الإيمان نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى إن شاء الله قبض اليد عن الأموال ويدخل فيها تحريم السرقة وقتل الطريق وأكل الرشا وأكل ما لا يستحقه شرعا not appropriating not consuming the property of others and this includes theft highway robbery usury consuming any money or property to which one is not entitled to under Islamic law any any time you take somebody's wealth without their permission and without them allowing it then this falls under this category so this is a branch of iman not doing any of the following as it comes in the quran do not devour uh, devour not another's possessions wrongfully do not uh, consume others wealth uh, wrongfully and uh, the verse for the injustice committed by those who were jews did we deny unto them some of the good things of life which had formerly been permitted to them and for their frequent obstruction of the way of Allah and their taking of usury even though it was forbidden to them and their wrongful devouring other people's wealth. So the Jews, because they committed usury and because they would take people's wealth without, uh, without, uh, without lawful means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denied them certain good things that were previously allowed. So their rulings became harder on them. Allah made certain things that were previously halal, He made it haram for them because of these things that they used to do. And uh, in the hadith, in the Sahihain, amongst the last uh, things that the Rasulullah said in his speech at Mina, he said that your lives, your possessions, and your honor are inviolable, meaning that you're not allowed to take a person's life or their possession or their honor uh, without the due Islamic process. And with that we will end. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakum wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi. If we have any questions, uh, we can take that now. Um, and after the questions we have, we do have snacks for everyone, inshallah. Any questions? Before we conclude for today. Uh, if sisters have any questions, you can send the questions. Uh, the questions will be uh, delivered, inshallah. Mm-hmm. And whatever they agree to. That falls under, because that has to be fulfilled. Right? That falls under the general command of fulfilling your covenants. Fulfilling your covenants. So the question was about uh, the, so in the marriage contract, there are things that are by default there. And there are certain things that the, the husband and bride, uh, the, the husband and uh, wife might agree to that are not necessarily in uh, the Quran or in the Hadith. For example, they might uh, agree that you have to pay me you know, I don't know, this amount of money every month or you can't take a second wife or something like that, right? That one is a bit controversial because some of the scholars mentioned that that might not be valid. But uh, if they agree to a certain something that is uh, a valid condition, then that falls under the uh, that falls under the the general ruling of fulfilling your command, your your covenant. Yes, if they agree in that, and if that's in the contract, then that becomes binding. That they have to they have to fulfill that. Allah All right. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, th this hadith, uh, it's not meant to be taken literally. It's meant to show that this person, they have reached such a low in their iman. At this time, it is as if they have no iman. But the iman is still there. Because they have not brought any nullifier of iman. Because sins do not take you out of iman. Right? Sins do not remove iman from you. So this hadith is not meant, meant to be taken literally that they're not, that a person might deduce from this that if they die in the state, that they're not a believer. No, they're, they're still a believer. But because they're committing this action, it is this, as, as if their iman has dropped all the way down. Because this is such an evil action that no person with iman would do something like this. But at the same time, we don't declare that anybody who's committed sins that their iman is completely gone. All right? This is the belief of the Khawarij, as we mentioned. That they believe that if you commit a major sin, then you have left Islam. And then there was another group. So another group came after them, which were the Mu'tazali. They said that this person is not a believer, but he's not a disbeliever either. He's, been, he's, في منزلة بين منزلة he's between two stations. But they said that he's going to be in the hellfire forever and, and hereafter. But we say that in this life, he's not a believer, he's not a disbeliever. This is another deviant group. They said that if he commits major sins, he's not a believer, but he's not a disbeliever. He's, he's in between. And the Khawarij, they said that he's a disbeliever. And Ahl Sunnah, we say that he's still a believer. If you commit major sins, including what's mentioned here, the adultery, uh, drinking of wine, theft, you're still a believer, but you have major, major deficiency in your iman. Allah Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question is about uh, highway robbery and uh, if things like blocking the road in warfare would be considered under that. No, no. So, so uh, of a, the, the of the people you are at war with. No, this would be con this would be permissible. This would be because this is because you're at war with them now. So this would be a type of warfare. This is a type of warfare. And this is what Rasulullah used to, but uh, it, it, it could be a bit more detailed, right? If you are, uh, depends, right? If it's, um, this is common people's wealth, or this is you're attacking the, the enemy. Specifying the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, right. Um, this would all be considered to be part of war, warfare. And we know that uh, the Rasulullah used to raid the caravans uh, of Mecca. And this is how the Battle of Badr right, started off. Where he was raiding the caravans. Although the wealth that was there was their wealth originally. Right? This is why he raided it. But these are a part, uh, a part of the of war. This is all part of war. Allahu Akbar. Well, we can look into that more, inshallah. So is there another narration of this? The adulterer is not a believer. He's not a true believer while doing the act. Possibly, but it would be the same interpretation. It would be the same interpretation, which is that they, uh, their iman is extremely low. But we don't declare them to be disbelievers. All right? So it falls back to the same principle, which is that sins do not take a person outside of Islam. Unless they make that sin lawful. Unless they say that this sin is lawful. This is when... Uh, this is when it becomes different. If a person says adultery is legal, lawful, then they have exited Islam. But if they, they, they commit adultery, but they say, I know this is haram, but they still do it, then uh, they're still declared to be a believer, but they have fallen into a major sin. Allah All right, so uh, we'll wrap up with that. Uh, a reminder, we have snacks outside for everyone. Inshallah, it's still there.
We have people that already have already gone to the snack snack station, so inshallah they left some for us. Wassallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh Sayyidina Muhammad wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.